Hello and welcome to Joy in Our Town. I'm George Cope and it's my privilege to uh, join you today in your home or your hotel room, wherever you're at and you're reaching TBN by way of television today. We are so delighted that you've chosen to join us. This program is dedicated to encouraging Central Florida with uh, ministries and organizations uh, that are serving and they are bringing joy to our faces and joy to our town because of the presence of Jesus Christ at work through lives of individuals that have committed themselves to serve. And today is no different. If you're a parent, uh, if you're a grandparent, you're going to want to stay tuned because we have a very interesting conversation uh, that is about to happen and we know it's going to make you smile today. So why don't you join me and let's welcome Jim Bilal. Jim, Hi. welcome to Joy in Our Town. Thank you for, for inviting me. I've, I, you already have a wonderful <laughs> smile. I, uh, I'm delighted uh, to meet you. Jim, uh, you serve as the pastor of South Street Ministries. Mm -hmm. You've been doing that since 2010. What is South Street Ministries? South Street Ministry is a uh, community development focused ministry that reaches into, uh, into the community where we're partnering with a community in need to, to work together to bring transformation into individuals' lives, families' lives, and the community overall. And where is the ministry located? In uh, downtown Orlando, right down the street from Bumby. So it's basically the corner of Bumby and South. Okay, so it's right downtown. And you're connected uh, to a, uh, a denominational church, correct? Correct. We're it, out of uh, First United Methodist Church of Winter Park. Okay, so the United Methodist Churches have a strong concern for compassion Absolutely. and ministry involvement. Well, tell me about yourself. Uh, I'm a, I'm a dad of two wonderful kids. Okay. Uh, I have a, uh, an 11 year old daughter and a 14 year old son, and um, they're they're wonderful kids. And I've just been uh, you know pastoring now for about five years with this ministry, and been a youth director for many years previous to that. Got you. So I was going to say that obviously you have what drew you to this. So clearly you have a call of God on your life to really engage with. The uh, teenage population. Absolutely, absolutely. It's um, I would say you know I'm really focused and feel drawn to relational ministry and and developing relationships that that glorify God, uh, that point to God's uh, hope and grace and peace, and uh, and that transformation occurs uh, as a result of that. You know, Jim, you talk about relationship, and we hear that word a lot, and, and almost to the point that we, you know, when you talk about authentic relationship or relationships. It's almost ho-hum, or we've heard that before. I'm really interested, and I think our viewers would be interested. What's your definition or your understanding of what authentic relationship really looks like? And then we're going to talk about how does that work with young people, because yeah. clearly... Yeah. Uh, I, I'm, I'm interested myself. How yeah, do we do yeah. that? What's so, authentic? So authentic relationship, I mean, if we were to just break down the definition, you have authenticity, which is, you know, a sense of being genuine or uh, um, of, of being worthy of, of belief, if you will. Uh, and then relationship is really, you know, simply a friendship, right? Or a connection, um, uh, a, a sense of mutual uh, interaction. And so, so if you put those together, what it is is really a genuine friendship or a genuine or um, trustworthy relationship. It's friends, <laughs> um, and and so uh, so I, I think when we when we're aiming for authentic relationships, what we're looking for within an authentic relationship is a sense of interdependence, where there's a give and a take within the within the relationship, where it's not a one-sided kind of of situation, but where both parties are equally pouring into one another's lives, but also receiving something as a result of that togetherness. Um, there's a there's a sense of, of trust. A sense of acceptance that's found in an authentic relationship, and then there's a there's a, a way of being transparent with one another, being honest and being vulnerable, sharing one another's uh, failures as well as one another's successes, and and so all of these, when when brought together, really uh, resemble a, a, an idea of discipleship that's that's uh, that's really God driven, where where both parties are growing and being encouraged by one another, but also being challenged by one another. Wow. Um, <clears throat> Are young people, teenagers, and I'm sure we've got parents and grandparents that are thinking now about their kids, do young people want that kind of relationship? I think, I definitely think young people are looking for that, and I think there's something within a young person where they can, they can tell if someone that's interacting with them is being genuine 
or, or not, or possibly agenda-driven in, in what they're saying. So are you suggesting that maybe the reason why even parents and grandparents don't connect is because they don't think a parent is being authentic with them? That, that absolutely could, could be the case. And, uh, and I think if, if, we, if we just stopped long enough to, to think about our own uh, friendships that we have and how we engage in those friendships, not that parents and, and children are supposed to be friends, but to, to just look at some of the nuances of that kind of relationship and apply that to interacting with, with a young person, um, we'll see a totally different kind of uh, uh, emerging relationship with that young person. So when a teenager is looking and you're meeting people, if you're downtown, you're basically reaching out to young people. You're creating that sort of like a brand new relationship. Mm -hmm. How do you go about doing that? Uh, how, how do you help introduce that to students? Yeah, that's a great question. And so, so, so uh, I, I mean, I can speak for, for my own personal experiences and what we try to do at South Street Ministry, which is really starting from a place of listening and asking questions before making assumptions or stepping into someone's life thinking this is what this, this person will need or this is what this person uh, thinks. <laughs> but really just genuinely asking and, and desiring to hear more from that person. And then the idea is that, you know, we're going to invest into one another without really expecting much in return. We know that, that when relationships relationships are forged that God transforms both both lives but but there isn't an expectation or agenda that drives that initiation of a, of a connection with a young person it's just we're going to invest and not expect to, to gain anything out of it and then um, it, you know it, it's a it's the taking the courage to be vulnerable to, to, to for me to share with a young person hey I'm I'm not great at this or, or I've failed in this way not feeling like I have to put up a front or, or be a certain way because I don't want them to see any cracks in the armor if you will and then and and then lastly, knowing that this is, this is something that takes time. Forging these relationships is not a quick thing and that, and that the risks are high, that, that both parties can be emotionally hurt <laughs> if things don't go well, but also that, that, uh, that this is a, it's just something that takes a lot of, a lot of time to, to get to a place of true authenticity. Yeah. And so it sounds a lot to me like discipleship was with Jesus and yeah. his disciples. Yeah. That's really what you're mirroring in the process. I think we're, we're always looking for the magic bullets aren't we? We're a society that wants a quick fix. Yeah. When a quick fix, uh, nothing can beat uh, honesty, openness, and a real sense of relationship. I, I, um, I don't have, uh, I have a daughter, a, a daughter that's in her 40s, and so I have a teenage granddaughter, but I haven't gotten there yet. So help me, Jim, would you please? What are some of the issues that these teens are facing out there that authentic relationships would help divert them from or help them through the process of understanding? Well, and it's interesting because I don't think the, the issues are that much different than when we were that age. I think the strongest thing is that young people are looking for a sense of identity and a sense of self. And so uh, as, as a young person is growing up, they're trying to figure out who am I and where do I fit into this world? And, uh, and, and, and what are the... What are the things that I bring <laughs> to the table in terms of what are my skills, um, what are my gifts, and and so I think young people are struggling with that, and and they're they're looking for a place to to formulate their identity, and they're looking for a place to to, to discover what they're good at, and then to be able to use those gifts and to and to to exercise those muscles, if you will, of those skills that they that they have and that they possess, and then ultimately, I think as parents and grandparents, we we aim to raise our children to be self-sufficient. Um, and I think self-sufficiency is an important part of, of, uh, of growing up. Um, and so I think, you know, children are, are you know, that's a, that's a pressure that, that children live with to be independent. But one of the beauties of, of relationship building, especially authentic relationships, is it can lead to an interdependency where, where um, both parties in this relationship um, are, are, are mutually uh, giving to one another and receiving from one another. So there's, it's, it's not a pressure of independence. You have to be on your own. But it's a, it's a, it's a, it's more of a team effort, if you will. If I were to come to uh, to uh, South Street Ministry, what would I find? 
What, what would I see? Would, do you have meetings? We, we have a, uh, I mean, we have an after school program uh, where we're working with uh, elementary age children um, that run from kindergarten up through fifth grade. It meets every day. And so we're working with kids, mentoring them with their homework and, and their academic success. Um, we have a, a community gathering once a week where families from the community come together. We share a meal. We worship. We praise God. And we, and we dig into the word. And we, and we just learn and grow from one another, exchanging thoughts and ideas. Um, we have we have programs for adults uh, in terms of uh, of how to how to to look forward to the next season within their life, and then we're also uh, we have work that reaches into the community, whether it's just community fellowship events um, or or ways to 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 assist in transforming the community and developing leaders within the community. All of it is relational based in building these uh, relationships. We got just a couple of minutes before we go to a break. Uh, could you give me some steps? some practical steps that teens can take to help them develop what you would say would be an authentic relationship? Well, I think um, trust would be the number one thing. Uh, in, in interacting with someone, uh, just trusting that, uh, that this person means well and that, um, that this relationship is, is, is not one-sided, but that there are, uh, there's much to be gained for both parties. And then also an openness to, uh, to, to what this person might bring into that particular teen's life. Um, that, uh, that if someone is willing to engage in getting to know someone, whether it's in a mentoring level or just a friendship level or a parenting level, that that person means well and they, they're bringing something that, that this person, can, this teen can, can learn from. And then, uh, and then being open to where God is leading this young person through this relationship. What is God trying to bring into their life, trying to draw out of them? What are the gifts that they possess that they can then begin to use and potentially develop relationships with others as a result? Wow. I, this is amazing. Um, I, I know that there is an address on your screen that you can uh, find information for Jim and uh, do you do you look for volunteers or people that can all help the time? You? All right. So again, where where uh, is the ministry if, located? If, uh, it's it's on the corner essentially of Bumby and South Street. So it's right in that quarter next to the 408 in okay. downtown Orlando. Good. So if you live in that neighborhood and you'd like to be involved, you go to that web address and uh, you reach out to uh, to Jim and let him know. And I just think it is an amazing thing to realize, Jim. God raised you up, and you bring joy to our community because. You're addressing a segment of our population that so many people are writing off and assuming that aren't really significant yet because they're quote unquote not adults, but they are the ones that if we don't help them now and formulate for the future, we will be in worse they will be, and so will our nation. So thank you for doing that. Well, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back, and Jim's going to, he's going to talk about youth at risk. This is a very, very complex issue and something that we need to talk about. But when we come back, we're going to delve into it. Thank you for joining us right here at TBN. You are a blessing to this ministry, and we pray that we are a blessing to you. And we're giving you reasons to smile for living in Central Florida. So you stay with us. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. here when you're ready. Welcome back to Joy in Our Town. I'm George Cope, and it's a privilege to uh, walk with you in this ministry every week as we interview individuals that have reasons, they're giving us reasons to smile for living right here in Central Florida. And it's nice to have Jim Bilal with us today. Jim, thank you for joining us. Jim is the pastor of uh, South Street Ministry. It is a uh, a ministry that is supported by the United Methodist Church of Winter Park. And Jim, you are reaching young people. We want to talk about understanding youth at risk. I'm not sure. We hear these kinds of, you know, these labels. Can you give me a story or give me a background? We're going to talk about youth at risk. 
Help me to understand what that means through a story or someone that you've talked to. I appreciate that question too, because yeah, it's really hard to define what at risk means because it's such a broad right. topic. Um, and so, so I don't know what your concerns were when you were in elementary school. I know for me, when I got home from school, it, my biggest concern was what snack am I going to have? You know, and and so, so uh, some of the students that that we encounter in our ministry, uh, some of the, the the hurdles or the the concerns that they might have, I can think of one student in particular, he, um, he's uh, one of three children and uh, he has a single mom who works two different jobs and so he's the only male person in the house and so he's, he's nine years old, he comes home from school and uh, he has to um, care for his younger siblings. He uh, has to make sure they have something to eat. Um, his one, his next youngest sibling is someone who's also in school, and so so he has to make sure that she's doing her homework. And so he carries this 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 burden of feeling like he needs to be the man, if you will, of the house. And uh, and so so not only does he have that, but he, he's struggling with authority and what his sense of authority might be. And uh, and then he has his own general you know education that he's he's concerned with. And so he has these pressures that that I know for myself personally, I did not have to encounter when I was younger. And so at risk means, you know, for in, in, in his world, he's at risk of not achieving his full potential academically or potentially even beyond in his life because of the many hurdles that he might have. There are additional uh, hurdles that uh, other children don't have. You know, we're a pretty affluent community. Let's just be honest. I mean, we have uh, with Disney and, and Universal and all the stuff and the millions of people that come to us, we don't tend to think of ourselves as being a community that would have a lot of these children at risk. Uh, am I accurate or inaccurate? Well, they, I mean, the studies show that about 20% um, of all children under the age of 18 across the country uh, are living at the poverty line or below. And, and a lot of children in that category fall into the at-risk category. So I would say we definitely have <laughs> plenty of, of children living at risk. So you're saying that two out of every 10 children in America are living at poverty or below, Absolutely. and therefore, is it just those children that you would classify at risk, or can middle, middle uh, America have children at risk as well. Yeah, I believe that that um, it, you know, I guess it depends on what the risk is, but absolutely, um, uh, children in in that in that middle bracket absolutely could be at sure. risk, and it, it might look different, but it's definitely at risk. Absolutely. So when you look at the neighbor or the uh, environment of uh, community that you're engaged with and those children. What would you, would you describe the young man? Would that be basically what at risk looks like for those that you're caring for? Absolutely, and, and I think at the heart of it is, is the, the pressure or the burden that that particular child's carrying day to day, a feeling of frustration, anger, resentment towards the fact that, that this is, you know, the responsibilities and the burdens that this particular child carries. So, I, I, again, we're trying to understand, and yeah. forgive me, I, I just want to help ask you some questions that help me to understand and our viewers as well. What are the contributing factors? There's got to be something that sets this in motion that makes these children basically, and, and to think about the wasted, a wasted life of great potential, that's got to be the thing that hurts your heart the most, isn't oh, absolutely. it? Absolutely. When you see the potential and you realize that the this at-risk situation, what are the contributing factors that parents or environment or cultures play. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you could you could really look at three different realms. I mean, it, it's the community within which the child is being raised. It's the particular family dynamics that might be playing out in the home. And then it's the own individual as well and, and, and the direction and the and the um, leadings that they might follow uh, in, in choices that they might make for their own life. And so so all of these different things play into 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 developing a potential of being at risk. And and you know from a community standpoint, it could be something as simple uh, really or as complicated as transportation to school. Um, if transportation is not readily available, then getting to school becomes a major hurdle and that doesn't always happen. And so then education is impacted by the fact that the child can't get to school. It could be um, the fact that, that maybe the, the crime rate is, 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 is high. Um, it could be even something environmental as the, the amount of noise level that a child is being raised in, in their community can impact their willingness and drive to learn and to grow. 
Um, at the family level, it's, it's, uh, it's things as, as, um, in such a way as, you know, if the family has health insurance, um, if, if, the, if the diet is there that, that, that is uh, a healthy diet for the child and the type of snacks or the type of meals that they might be eating. It could be uh, the fact that parents are, are working, uh, that there's a lot of transient uh, experience within the home, that their people are in and out, and so, so there's, there's not a lot of... Uh, time of, of bonding with the parent and then also parent con contribution into the child's academic success. And then finally, within the individual themselves, uh, there's this thing called the technical divide where um, a lot of schools now are, are basing their homework on accessing websites and doing certain things on the computer and the child might not have access to a computer. Instead of, of admitting that or saying that they don't have a computer, they'll just take the, the, uh, the F, if you will, and not do the, 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 the project. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so, so things like that impact their own sense of, of well-being, their own sense of self, their sense of acceptance within, within the world. And, and, and then that begins a domino effect of having a sense of purpose and having a sense of hope within their life. I, I, it, my heart's heavy, sincerely. I, I, I feel uh, a great sense of, of respect for what you're doing, Jim, and at the same time to realize that we live in a community where these things are going on that we drive by and we don't realize. I, I'm concerned... Um, other than a child not living up to their potential, what are, what, are there physical things? What, what are other results that come as a result of this at-risk child? What are they at risk beyond mm -hmm. just not reaching their full potential? Sure, yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's almost like a domino effect of decision-making that comes as a result. And so um, there's, a, there's a risk of, of um, entering into a world of crime, uh, of drug use, of alcohol abuse, of... Uh, um, early pregnancy, uh, all of these uh, traps that that can that can set a child back in their development and their and their uh, their potential. Um, the, all all these things can you know uh, come into play uh, in terms of decision making. We've talked a lot about the tough stuff. Uh, can you give me a story of someone? Obviously, you can't use their name, but right. give me a success story. Yeah, what have absolutely. you seen happen we, in uh, South Street Ministry? We we uh, we had this one uh, 16-year-old girl who uh, who it was in a similar situation where her two younger siblings, two younger brothers, she was caring for. Mom works all day and into the night, and so she was responsible for picking them up from school. She would bring them to our after-school program, and uh, and she just hang out in the office. And she's a she's a great girl but she was a little kind of uh, distant, not really sure what to make of us there in, in our office and if we were, you know, trustworthy or not. And, um, and so she would just hang out there because she wasn't going to go home and then come back when the program was over with her kids and uh, to take her kids home, her, her siblings. And so we began to get to know one another. And, uh, and, and so over time, she, uh, she started coming to our weekly worship gathering that we have and just checking it out with her siblings because it was something else for them to do. They'd get a meal and they'd, they'd had, you know, some place to be, if you will. Well, lo and behold, over time of, of just being in community with one another, one day she just decided, I'm going to read scripture in our, in our service. And she got up and read. And then beyond that, we heard her singing and she ended up singing in our worship praise team, wow. uh, which was just so counter to who she, uh, who she was. And she was very reserved. And here she was coming out of her shell. Well, this past summer, she, um, she got to a place where she was volunteering in our summer camps, mentoring younger kids and being a flag bearer, if you will, for the ministry in the community where she was encouraging other people her age to come and be a part of what was happening there, wow. becoming a spokesperson, if you, if you will, living out what she had experienced in this transformation. It was, it was phenomenal to, to see. Uh, it's got to do your heart well then, as you say, when you do invest this time and trust and energy to see those kinds of people come out of that, and it's, it's rescuing one in that process. I, um, I would... Uh, I'd like for you to take just a couple of minutes and talk to people, um, parents, grandparents. Um, I, we do live in a stressful season, and they may have teenagers that they are struggling with or grandchildren, and they don't know how to relate. Would you just take a few moments and talk to uh, our, the adults that are watching today and give them some pointers on what they can do to build an authentic relationship and really make the investment in their kids. And then, if you'd really do me, since you're a pastor, would you pray for me? That <laughs> would really be helpful. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I, uh, 
I, I want to begin by, by saying to you, the parent or the grandparent that's watching, um, I, uh, I, 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 I have sat with teenagers who have looked at me and, and said, hey, if you're going to be in my life, then, then, then I hope you mean it that I hope you're really here, that I hope you're consistently a part of my life. And I've felt challenged and convicted by that. And so in some ways, I kind of want to present that challenge to you, that if you're, if you're struggling with your own child or if you know of, of another young person that, that you might be seeing uh, display actions that, you're, that concerns you, then if you want to help, then mean it and, and, and consistently be a part of that child's life. Uh, I want to encourage you to, to see each child that you interact with, each young person, as a valued gift of God. And each, th this is where we begin, right? All of us are children of God, and all of us matter, and all of us have gifts that God has given us to, to bring to this world. And so begin from that place to see your young person that's in your life as someone who has gifts, who has value and worth, someone who is a child of God. And I think if we can see children from that place, then that changes the lens through which we interact with them and how we, we, we pour into their lives. And so I encourage you to, to be honest with, with that young person, to trust, to be more open to listening to what it is that they have to say. Don't bring an assumption to the table, but, but just be open to, to, to their expertise in being a teenager in today's world. Learn from them and then help in a, in a trusting way guide them towards better decisions or, or a different frame of reference in terms of how to navigate through this world. Uh, I know that, that, that God calls us uh, in, the, in the book of Proverbs to, to sharpen one another as iron sharpens iron. And uh, we can do that in a graceful and loving way through encouraging one another and being, uh, and being genuine in how we interact with one another. And that applies not just to adults, but also to the young people in your life. So I'd love to pray with you if we could. Let's pray. Loving and gracious God, you are good. You are loving and you are grace filled. Help us, Lord, to live that out, not just in our interactions with one another in our adult lives, but also with the young people that are in our lives. Help us to, to not just see them as uh, someone with potential, but to see them as someone overflowing with gifts. Help us, Lord, uh, convict our hearts to, to provide pathways for them to realize their full potential, to draw them closer to you, to pull them out of whatever uh, situation or circumstance they might be in so that long enough so that they can see that they are a gifted child of you. And encourage all of us, Lord, to engage in these relationships and to, to not just uh, talk about the concern for the young people of today, but to get involved, to get to know a young person, and to learn from them. We pray this in your holy and blessed name. Amen. Amen. Jim, thank you so much for being here today. If you want to know more about his ministry, check out his website. We would love for you to do that. Well, I trust that you have a smile on your face now that you've spent some time with us here at TBN. Know that Trinity Broadcasting Network cares about you. They love you. That's why this program is here. So we look forward for you joining us next week. We'll have another guest to talk to you about why you should smile in living in Central Florida. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week. Bye for now. This program has been sponsored by the Trinity Broadcasting Network. Post Office Box A, Santa Ana, California, 92711.